Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for showing up after the wild night yesterday, no doubt. I'm here to talk about why you should invest in Bitcoin today. First, a little bit about myself. I'm author of a financial newsletter. It goes out to 1,500 investors in Belgium and the Netherlands. <clears throat> and the reason or the way, my way towards the newsletter um, started when I started feeling uneasy about insolvency everywhere around me and uh, I didn't quite know what to do about it as a saver, uh, as an entrepreneur, as an investor. I didn't know how to respond to this so that's how I started writing and researching and that turned into the newsletter. And my approach is that for the theory I use Austrian school economics. Uh, I like to read a lot of history to see if there's patterns that happened in the past that I can recognize today to help me see what's ahead. And then also I think that if you want to acquire practical knowledge, and investing is all about everyday practical decisions, I think it's not enough just to read and uh, read on the internet and then and then write, I mean, synthesize and write about what your thoughts are. I, th I think it's also about going out there, talking to people, making your hands dirty. And um, that's why <clears throat> I've been traveling quite extensively in the past few years uh, with a focus on Latin America. I think Latin America is very, very interesting because um, there is a lot, a lot of experience there with, finan with financial crises in the past few decades. Uh, they've had any imaginable crisis on this and the sun and so there's a lot of experience on the individual level for savers and investors about how to respond to this at least that's what I figured before I went and lo and behold that's how it happened that uh, in the summer of 2011 I was in Buenos Aires and my friends there they couldn't stop talking to me about this currency called Bitcoin and um, I, uh, I became infected I had to do the research and um, in January 2012, I added Bitcoin to our recommended currency basket. It was $5 at the time, so obviously we did very well. But I'm here today and I'm here to talk about why Bitcoin is a solid investment, why it's a great value proposition even today with prices of around $120. So I'm going to outline the, the talk just a little bit. First, I'm, I'm going to answer two of the biggest myths, I believe, objections against Bitcoin uh, from the investor perspective. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the general pers um, the, the economic context we're living in, because I don't think you can evaluate the risks of Bitcoin without looking at everything else that's going on. And then finally, I'm going to uh, give my thoughts about what we can expect, perhaps, for Bitcoin in the future price-wise, what kind of prices we might see in the future. So, to get started, the big bubble um, argument, is Bitcoin a bubble? People, a lot of people have come to learn about Bitcoin only in the past six months, and what, what they've seen is a gigantic run-up in the price, and then a big crash, a big panic, and uh, then you see these kind of analogies you see up there. Um, is Bitcoin like the dot-com bubble? Is it over? And the Nasdaq hasn't, it, hasn't recovered yet from the levels of 2000, so are we going to see the same in Bitcoin? It's interesting to ask this question to people that have been around a bit longer in the Bitcoin world. And <laughs> without exception, they're incredibly underwhelmed by these kind of things. People really shrug when they, when, they, when they look at this and hear the objections because they've seen a bubble already in 2010. Look at that. A big run-up and a big crash. Another bubble in 2011. It went up 1,000% from $1 to $30 and then crashed down to $2. And then, of course, the, the most recent one in 2013. So, obviously, there is something wrong with this idea of the that Bitcoin would be some kind of traditional uh, bubble. Let's first define our terms. What are we talking about? What is a bubble in uh, economic terms? <clears throat> a bubble is defined as trade in high volumes at prices that are considerably at variance with intrinsic values. And what is being referred to here, the intrinsic values, is usually some kind of ratio. Uh, for example, the P-E ratio in the stock market. And then you can look back at the historical mean and see if you are deviating from that. And then you can say, well, we are in bubble territory, such as was the case uh, with the Nasdaq in the early 2000s. 
However, I think it's, it's much more fruitful because Bitcoin is not a stock. It's, it's not a stock. It doesn't have uh, profit projections and, and all these kind of things. It doesn't have the, the customer base that, that needs to bring in revenue, etc., etc. In the first place, I believe, um, we we're talking about a technology. We we're talking about an innovation. Cryptocurrency is a technology. And what do we know about technologies that have mass appeal? We know that they tend to follow an S-shaped adoption curve. Here are some famous technologies, the radio, the color television, uh, the cell phone. We can, we can say the same for the internet. So every time again we see an S-shaped adoption curve, for example here with voice over IP, I used Skype as a proxy for that. <clears throat> so the beginning of that is, is a parabolic rise in the user base. And in Bitcoin we see very similar things. For example, I used here my wallet as a proxy for uh, the user growth in Bitcoin. My wallet is an application that allows people to manage their Bitcoins online. Um, and so with this in mind, there's a couple of things we know now. We can, we can make a very simple, um, a very simple logic reasoning. We know for one, the Bitcoin supply is limited. We know two, the user base right now is growing at an exponential rate. And the third thing we know is that in order to ad adopt Bitcoin as a technology individually, what, what do you do? The same thing as what you did when you bought your first radio or television, you just buy it, you buy Bitcoin. So putting those three together, this parabolic rise in price that we're seeing over time shouldn't really surprise us. And that's why I think rather than seeing the price in this fashion, which tends to scare investors horribly, they don't want to touch this thing with a 10 feet pole if they see something like this. You can look at the very same price in a different way. <clears throat> this is the same price, but in a logarithmic scale, and then you see a very orderly um, increase in price, and so just the reflection of a parabolic adoption curve. So that's why um, I'm not worried at all about the, the argument that it's, um, it's um, a bubble, this is a false uh, argument, I would argue. And then the second myth is the volatility that I believe that this is a myth that the volatility will is somehow will never go away, for example, and uh, it will forever be an insurmountable problem uh, for Bitcoin to be ever generally accepted. There's th three general reasons and let's go over them and then see whether we can expect change for the volatility in the future. First reason I think is um, the fact that there are speculators, we, we're in a small market still, so, and, and it's rising, so that attracts a lot of speculative capital. People are, are, are hungry, are greedy, they jump in, they use leverage, and then they tend to panic and sell, so that's why we have these gyrations in price, that's one reason. A second reason is the bottleneck effects we're seeing. Um, these are the growing pains of Bitcoin. We, we see exchanges that were not prepared for a surge in interest. All, all of a sudden there's a lot of volume that they were not prepared for. In 2011 there were attacks that they were not prepared for. Um, and that uh, caused uh, some of the exchanges to be hacked. Today it was more the, the um, high frequency trading that was a problem. And so it's important to take a look at this because from an investor perspective, you kind of want to know that if you move into the asset class, there is kind of, well, will there be an exit? Can I, can I in the future diversify away from Bitcoin? Should I, should I want to? I think there's a couple of solutions to this uh, problem of the bottlenecks with the exchanges, I mean. First of all, trial and error. That's something we're seeing happening already. There's a lot of exchanges that have um, closed their business. And right here at the conference, we see a lot of new initiatives uh, getting started, people that want to learn from the mistakes of the past. Um, there is, um, uh, people are also looking, uh, I mean, the exchange entrepreneurs are looking outside of their own jurisdictions. These days also, we're looking at offshore solutions. Sometimes we see efforts towards decentralization. I'm thinking of Buttercoin, for example, um, and uh, Ripple, Open, OpenCoin, those kind of initiatives. And then uh, finally, and I think this is the most important long-term trend, is that the Bitcoin economy as a whole is, uh, is growing um, and we are seeing the budding start, the embryonic start of a, a financial system in itself. And what does that mean? It means for the investor that it's very likely that in the future you'll be able to sell your Bitcoins directly in return for the other asset class you're interested in. You will be able to buy commodities with Bitcoin, buy futures with Bitcoin, shares with Bitcoin. Uh, and so 
this, this idea that we always need to go back to fiat first and then back to Bitcoin, I think over time that will become less, less of a pressing problem. Uh, actually, the, the European Central Bank kind of confirms this in their report, uh, Virtual Currency Schemes of October 2012, which was mainly about Bitcoin. I think they mentioned Bitcoin about 150 times in this report. And when they say that it cannot be ruled out that non-banks, and with this they mean um, Bitcoin-related, Bitcoin-based financial companies, so it cannot be ruled out that non-banks will develop more independent strategies and will no longer need to ally themselves, ally themselves with banks. That's quite interesting, I think. And then finally, for the volatility, um, I think it's important to realize that Bitcoin is a commodity and it's a very, very new commodity. And we've seen throughout history, um, not very many, but sometimes it happened there that there was a new commodity to come to the market. For example, petroleum. Petroleum was discovered in the 19th century, around 1850 in the United States, a little bit later. And so we have a lot of data available on what happened with uh, petroleum prices in those early days. And this is um, one of those examples. This is the oil price uh, from 1860 all the way through to 1960. And uh, you want to look at the yellow graph because that's the inflation adjusted price. <clears throat> and what you see is incredible volatility in the oil price, incredible volatility. And this doesn't even show the whole picture because this is on a yearly basis. We're not even seeing the monthly and daily gyrations. Uh, and also what we're not seeing here is that the petroleum price in the early days was not uniform at all. There were very different prices within the United States depending on where you lived and where you went. And this of course reminds us of Bitcoin today, that there is very different prices in the exchanges at times. So uh, I think over time, Bitcoin prices will evolve just like um, these prices have evolved. They tend to stabilize. There is all kinds of mechanism that develop to, uh, to help uh, with that. Uh, but I don't think we will see a downward stabilization because, of course, the oil supply it skyrocketed for the first hundred years. We saw an, an, a yearly rise and increase in oil production, which explains the... the the, the drop in price over time. Of course, Bitcoin has a limited supply. The supply will tend to decline over the years. And that's why I think we will see stabilization, but rather at higher levels. And I really like this slide because <laughs> it's a good way to step over into the next thing I want to talk about, which is the comparison with the current system, the current financial system. Bitcoin is a new uh, system, it's a new way of doing things. It can be, uh, it can be uh, in the future, operate completely independently. So in that sense, it's really da uh, David that's um, kind of defeating uh, or challenging Goliath. So let's take a look at the old system. What do we know about money supply, for example? <clears throat> this is the US dollar money supply. Uh, it's one of the more conservative estimates. It's the, the Austrian true money supply and uh, we see a parabolic uptrend. Why is that? Because the, the United States government left the gold standard in 1971. The, the dollar is no longer pegged to anything and that allows governments, central banks to print as much as they desire and so they do. <clears throat> also, uh, governments are able to sell uh, debt to central banks. This is what you see here. There is uh, the balance sheets of a couple of uh, central banks, the most important central banks added up together. We see also that this debt is rising exponentially. Uh, and uh, in, uh, from, from, if you look at it from the other side, what you see is a gigantic bond bubble. <clears throat> the estimated public debt in the world today, this is uh, numbers from 2011. If you look at the latest numbers, we're talking about $50 trillion worth of public debt in the world. It is more or less tripling every 10 years now. So this is, of course, completely unsustainable. But the question is, is there a tipping point? When, when is going to be the time that we change from insolvency and we make the change towards bankruptcy? When, when is that going to happen? Well, talk about unsustainability. There are some interesting voices coming from the developing world. For example, this one from Mexico. This is from a paper by Guillermo Ortiz, who is the governor of the Mexican Central Bank. He decided to compare debt levels in um, um, what you see on the right-hand side, debt levels in Southern Europe uh, with those of, on the left-hand side, Latin America in the late 80s. 
and the late 80s was a horrible time for Latin America. There was complete meltdown in the economy because the debts were too high. So the average debt in those areas uh, was around 82 percent debt to GDP. Uh, in 2009, this was more or less the average for Southern Europe. Today, we're already four years later. The debt levels are much, much higher. The average debt in Europe, in fact, has risen 50 percent since um, 2007. That's public debt, government debt. And so uh, this seems to be completely unsustainable. Uh, these numbers are OECD numbers. So 2010, public debt in the 34 Western nations risen to 106 percent debt to GDP. Compare that, for example, to the Latin America I was talking about, or also the USSR, which um, had public debt of 75 percent debt to GDP when the ruble crisis uh, occurred in 1998. So it seems that in many respects we are out of our debts. I just highlighted public debt here because it's easily understandable, but there's, this, is just, this just, just scratches the surface. I haven't even mentioned the 700 trillion derivatives bubble, 78% uh, of which is based on interest rate movements. Uh, we are, we're seeing historically low interest rates in the world. This is going to change, and so the derivatives bubble, no doubt, one day is going uh, to blow up. We have terrible leverage in the banks. These banks are, are are craving for new money every day. Um, so these are just a few of the problems, and it seems like we are nearing um, some kind of resolution. But what is that going to be? Because as investors, we're pragmatic. We, we kind of want to know if, uh, if we should worry about the next couple of months, about the next couple of years, or if it's further away. Because if it's further away, it might not affect our decision of today that much. Well, I think there is actually a sea change coming, and I think that Rubicon uh, is something we're going to cross when um, financial policy turns from bailout towards bail-in. Bailout is something we're all familiar with. It's what started occurring in 2008. Basically, you save institutions, uh, government, and mainly banks. You save them from the outside by pouring money in and not really by making them healthy. You kind of turn them into zombie banks. That's what they did. You just barely give them enough so they can survive. So that was bailout. Today it's bail-in. Um, we saw it in Cyprus. Um, I'll explain in a moment what bail-in exactly means, but um, the question is, of course, is Cyprus the exception? Is it the exception? Is it just to say, oh, we don't want these uh, Russian oligarchs on our uh, European territory, so we're going <laughs> to... Uh, of course, we know that all the oligarchs were already gone before the banks were closed, but that's another story. So is this an exception or not? I don't think it's an exception at all, uh, actually. I think this is part of uh, financial policy, because we have to understand that financial policy does not... It's not decided on a national level. It's not the Minister of Finance that one day wakes up and says, oh, we're going to do this or that. It's not even the central bank. Uh, there is a hierarchy in the system, and if you climb the ladder, you come and meet these international institutions. You meet the IMF, which is the policing agency. They are the ones who implement the guidelines, and then you go higher up. You meet the Bank for International Settlements, which is both a think tank and uh, an important... Well, it's, it's the central bank of the central banks, and then even higher, you meet the Financial Stability Board. It's very little known, but um, it's, it's recognized by the G20 as having financial authority over its 60 member central banks. You can look it up. They have a website called financialstabilityboard.com. I recommend reading their latest papers. And so, um, talking about this bail-in, what we saw is that they published an important uh, report uh, about, uh, sorry, in the summer of 2011, where they decided to change global financial policy. The title was Effective Resolution of Systemically Important Financial Institutions. And what were they proposing in that document? They proposed policy measures to resolve large banks without systemic disruption and without exposing the taxpayer to the risk of loss. Let's read this carefully. What, what are they talking about? They're talking about resolving large banks. To resolve a bank, it doesn't mean to bail them out. It means to, um, to have an orderly bankruptcy. It's really something else than bailing out a bank. An orderly bankruptcy, and they don't want systemic disruption. So they don't want that other banks are, infected, um, are affected by this. They don't want that other governments are affected by this. And they want to do this without using tax money. So this seems like quite challenging what they're trying to do there. 
So let's be a bit more specific. In the same documents, we read that um, <clears throat> what is proposed is essential elements of a bail-in regime to enable creditor-financed recapitalization of financial institutions. <clears throat> So the bail-in regime, I'm going to explain that in a moment. What it, well, let's do, it, let's do it now, in fact. What it means is that we are not going to save the bank from the outside. We're going to look from the inside. And we can't change anything about the asset side of the balance sheet. We can make some changes on the liability side. Let's see what, what, what kind of obligations the bank has to pay um, um, uh, institutions on the outside. So who are the creditors um, to the bank? There are governments that have borrowed money to the bank. There are other banks that have borrowed money to the bank. And then, of course, there are the savers, the individuals who have borrowed money to the bank. And you might think, I haven't borrowed money to the bank, but of course, uh, deposits are considered to be credit to the bank. This is already since the 19th century. Um, it's, it's part of the legal tradition in the West that you are a creditor to the bank if you have a saving account uh, with it, even just a, a, a side account. So we're going to use people's savings. Let's, let's turn this into everyday reality. It means basically this. You wake up one morning, you open up your bank account and your computer, and what you see all of a sudden is like this gentleman who had a business in Cyprus and who had a bank account with Likey Bank. He saw all of a sudden that 85% of his assets were frozen, no longer accessible. Um, basically, what this gentleman experienced was the same as what the Argentines experienced with the Coralito in 2001. It, this is a bank holiday in the works. This is today. This is uh, European Union. Um, this is the breach of the promise to uh, guarantee people's deposits. <clears throat> so, um, back to that document of 2011, they made a lot of uh, policy guidelines. Uh, of course, these had to be implemented. The expectation was that by December 2012, these, all these guidelines had to be implemented, the bail-in regimes. We're, we're past that date now. The um, Financial Stability Board uh, launched uh, an, or, or published an evaluation to see, to assess how many nations have actually accepted this as legislation. And based on that, I made this little map that shows us um, the, um, the places in the world where today either bail-in resolution is already enacted into law or is in the process of being enacted into law. And just to close, um, again to, to um, validate my point, the, the one that I said before, that we have this hierarchy in the financial uh, system. First, we saw that in the big, uh, by the way, to explain this, uh, this graph, what I did is a Google search on the various websites, imf.org, uh, bis.org, and financialstabilityborg.org uh, for the word bail-in. And then I mapped it out, and what you see is that the IMF started thinking about it. The first, this is the big think tank, then the idea trickled up towards the financial government, which uh, published their report in 2011. And what we see happen now is that the IMF, the policing agency, is now uh, in the works of enforcing this uh, throughout the world. This is, of course, just my theory. Um, it, is, uh, it is what concerns me. It is the reason why I think that um, we should be uh, more worried than uh, a lot of newspapers, a lot of other publications will uh, want to make us believe. Um, and that's why I think the risks we are facing today are bank holidays. We, uh, the risks we're facing are capital controls. Uh, we can see bond crashes happen and uh, devaluations in, uh, in a lot of countries. So this is not a very happy story, is it? <laughs> uh, however, I think there is a silver lining because wherever there is a risk for a big meltdown in the economy, there is an equally great opportunity for a melt up in certain asset classes. Because the wealth in the world, the assets in the world don't just disappear. What usually tends to happen is a transfer of wealth. And which are the assets that might benefit from such a meltdown? Uh, they tend to be assets that are very, very liquid because people know that there's uncertainty. They want to have flexibility. And it's also assets that don't have third-party risks, like bonds, for example, or derivatives, or so many, or fiat money even has third-party risk. And combining those, combining those two characteristics are what we know as hard money, gold, silver, and specifically Bitcoin as well. So that's the silver lining. Uh, and I think there is some empirical evidence already that Bitcoin is serving as a safe haven uh, for uh, investors, for savers, people that are worried uh, around the world. Here is, for example, Spain. 
This is the amount of people that were interested in buying and selling Bitcoin on a local level just before the bank runs in Cyprus. <clears throat> and uh, the next uh, image I'm going to show you is the very same map, but 60 days later, right after the bank runs in Cyprus. Oh, blue and red. Uh, the blue ones are the people that want to buy bitcoins. The red ones are the people that, w that are interested in, in selling some bitcoins. This doesn't even show the whole picture. Actually, if you zoom in in Madrid, for example, you see that all these little um, uh, flags are stacked up behind each other. Also, my personal experience in Argentina really validates uh, my idea that bitcoin is actually a safe haven instrument. Uh, there are a lot of people mining um, uh, bitcoins in Argentina, people are soliciting to being paid in, uh, in, in bitcoins. My friends are now ordering the, their uh, organic vegetables uh, in bitcoin in, um, in Buenos Aires. Um, actually, the, the graphics of this uh, presentation, which I don't know if you agree, but I think are wonderful, are made by um, an Argentine friend of mine, and of course I paid him in bitcoin. <clears throat> so. Yes, Argentina shows us how Bitcoin can shine in very, very harsh circumstances because capital controls in Argentina are some of the harshest in the world right now. Uh, it's extremely hard to move money in and out of the country. Uh, it's, it's, of course, saving is completely dissuaded because the inflation is very high. Uh, and if my idea is that if the world tomorrow looks more like Argentina, Again, Bitcoin will show its, its, its worth. It will show that it's an anti-fragile asset. Uh, it will show that it, it is incredibly flexible and uh, will allow for people to continue to save uh, despite the destruction of a lot of wealth in the world. So having said all this, let's take a look at possible future valuations of Bitcoin. I wanted to give the you know, prepare, make this preparation towards this point because some of the projections I'm going to give might seem quite outlandish if, if I would just give them at face value. <clears throat> the context, I believe, is this. We have the S-shaped adoption curve, and what you see below that is the ki kind of the demographic profile uh, that's generally um, um, connected with the different phases of the S-shaped adoption curve. So first we have the innovators, the innovator stage. Perhaps this is where we were in uh, 2011 in London um, when there was 150 attendants and um, the, there were no high profile, uh, not many high profile uh, people attending. Today that's very different. We have a lot of opinion leaders that are extremely interested in it. I believe there's quite a number of them uh, present right here. They have a lot of knowledge, they have capital to back it up, and they're going to make Bitcoin big and boring so that the majority can start accepting it. So that's why I think we are right there. We have a long way to go in the growth of Bitcoin. And let's now take a look at some possible future valuations. <clears throat> Global hedge funds, for example, they have around $2.3 million trillion excuse me, under management, uh, a part of which is cash. So we can imagine they might diversify just 1% into Bitcoin. Should that happen, according to my calculations, the Bitcoin price should rise to over $1,000 for one Bitcoin. Uh, Argentina, there's about $50 billion worth of um, paper money circulating, and I do mean dollars, so greenbacks circulating in Argentina. Should the Argentines one day decide, or maybe over time decide, to uh, switch that into Bitcoin, Bitcoin prices will rise to, rise to over $2,000 per Bitcoin. Gold bugs, gold is money, but Bitcoin is money too, and it has some interesting characteristics. So maybe in the future, um, people that own gold today might want to divest just 1% into Bitcoin, in which case we can see prices rise to over $3,500 for a Bitcoin. <laughs> and then if we've arrived there, I mean, why wouldn't it just keep continuing? I don't see why not, because the more people get involved, the stronger the network becomes, the more entrepreneurs that are there to make things very easy so that even grandmothers can start using it, etc. So let's um, continue our possible projections. We know that the global shadow economy, for example, has a size of around $15 trillion. This is uh, 2012. If we assume that the volume of Bitcoin today would rise to something equal to that of the shadow economy, so basically people would, the black market would become a, a Bitcoin-based or a cryptocurrency-based black market, and uh, if I assume then that the Bitcoin price would rise equally so, which we can talk about whether that's uh, a good idea, then Bitcoin prices would rise to around $160,000 for a Bitcoin. <clears throat> Should Bitcoin become actually become the new gold? People talk about Bitcoin like gold 2.0, the new gold. Um, they actually use that phrase quite 
uh, loosely these days. If, if this really is the case, we know that there's around 155,000 tons of above-ground gold. These are the most conservative estimates I could find, the James Turk estimates, <clears throat> and uh, multiply that with the gold price. Total valuation is around $7.2 trillion. Uh, so if Bitcoin really does become the new gold, one Bitcoin should be worth around $340,000. I mean, imagine the implication. You own three Bitcoins today, and that makes you a millionaire tomorrow. You own 3,000 Bitcoins, and you're on your way to become a billionaire. <laughs> I mean, so you can see the kind of uh, risk-reward ratio we are talking about. <clears throat> and then finally, I mean, you know, Bitcoin is the new gold. The black market is using Bitcoin. Why wouldn't Bitcoin become the new world reserve currency? <laughs> and then based on, again, the most conservative numbers I could find, uh, what, I, what I come up with is a Bitcoin price a little over uh, half a million dollars for one Bitcoin. So very exciting indeed. <laughs> um, again, that's why I think the risk-reward ratio of Bitcoin is extraordinary. Everybody should own just a few Bitcoins, even if it's just a tiny percentage of what you own. My subscribers, the ones that invested just 1% of their assets in Bitcoin, they're now between 20-25% in Bitcoin uh, with hardly any risk. <clears throat> so uh, because I advise them to, to actually sell off what they put in, uh, making the risk, uh, turning the risk into zero. So that's uh, talking about Bitcoin alone. I just want to mention that uh, cryptocurrency, this technology we are um, talking about, is more than just Bitcoin alone. Um, there is still 10 million Bitcoins that are unmined. They have a value today of more than $1 billion. If the Bitcoin price keeps rising, this uh, will, will become a multi-billion uh, multi dollar industry. So uh, to look at Bitcoin mining, I think, is, uh, is not only interesting, but can be very profitable. Of course, you have to be careful about which decisions you make. There is Bitcoin denominated stock markets. This is still very early stage. However, there's a few companies that have market caps of over $20 million today. And they've grown from, from very, very small sizes. Um, it's incredibly exciting, these Bitcoin denominated stock markets, because you get paid, for example, you get paid dividends in Bitcoin. Isn't that nice? You know? And some of the stocks I own, they have dividend yields of uh, 20, 30 percent annualized. So I, I, don't, I don't mind about that. <laughs> um, that's very promising, I think, in the future. Also, bond markets, these are really uh, embryonal. It's, it's very, very early on uh, because the Bitcoin price is rising fast and also because globally interest rates are very low. I think this will change. Uh, interest rates are just too low. This will change. And once credit markets globally start drying up, I think there will be a, a, a flourishing Bitcoin bond market. So uh, we can look into that. And then finally, there's the alternative cryptocurrencies, uh, Litecoin, Namecoin, Terracoin, those, uh, those currencies. Uh, they're still very small today, but maybe tomorrow there'll be some brilliant developers that start really building upon them. And in the long run, I really think that the market share of these currencies can grow. Now, I think we're looking at between 3 and 5% compared to Bitcoin. Uh, I think over time, this might rise to maybe 10%. Uh, why? because we have network effects um, in Bitcoin making it um, so makes that makes it logical that it should be the most dominant one in the future however as with Facebook and, and all the other social networks we see that there's always a demand from a certain niche in the population that just wants something different uh, and uh, that's maybe part of the reason why uh, Litecoin in the past three months rose 1500 percent versus Bitcoin few people know this but it was a very interesting place to be <clears throat> I write about these things um, very often, about Bitcoin in general, Bitcoin as investment. Uh, if you're interested to know a bit more details, I'm working on um, a uh, report, report about this. I'm happy to send it to you. Just surf to my website and, uh, uh, or send me an email at tutormeister.com. I'll be happy to uh, send it to you. And that's it. I'm happy to hear if there are any questions. Yeah, please, because then it's recorded as well. Hi, yeah, too. You know, you said that you've got macro trends. Your newsletter um, is the demographic of your sub subscribers changing because of your Bitcoin coverage. Ah, huh, that's interesting. I think I think that's the case because certain people, 
Certain people are quite attached to the investment choices they've been making in the past. Um, we've seen this in the gold community, for example. Um, a lot of the gold community acts a little bit like rabbit in headlights. Uh, a friend of mine who was a big silver bug, she said the feeling of what happened to Bitcoin in the last few months, for her it was like just this bullet whizzing by and she, like, she was waiting for the big you know, price explosion in, in silver and like, where did this come out of? So yeah, I do think also the demographic of, uh, of Bitcoin is, is much younger. Average age of what I could find is around 34. Uh, maybe this is changing now. Uh, and so there is a technological gap. There is also uh, the jump from you know, the idea that if you can't hold it, you don't own it towards this very challenging notion of Bitcoin. So yeah, I do think uh, it, is, it is changing. Um, th thanks, that was a great talk, really oh, enjoyed thanks. it. I wanted to ask you, in your critique early on about fiat currencies and why Bitcoin makes sense in today's context, you talked about a lack of liquidity and a lack of, a lack of interchangeability of money, of ability right. to get into the currency and get out of the currency. And I'm, I'm in the back thinking, well, that, that sounds a little like Bitcoin itself, too. Today, if you take some of Gox's challenges and the lack of liquidity in other exchanges, there's also the average person has, a, has difficulty buying and holding Bitcoin itself. So I wonder if you could comment on that. And how do you see that evolving over time? And, and do you think that's a challenge to the adoption of Bitcoin long term? You mean the lack of liquidity, for example? Well, the lack of interchangeability, the, oh, ability, interchangeability. To, the ability to buy Bitcoin for the average person that doesn't have the knowledge of how to do that. Well, I think uh, it all depends a little bit on, 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 on the short run. It depends on how governments will, will decide to, what, what they'll decide to do with Bitcoin. Um, it's challenging. I mean, uh, my friends in Argentina, they, they, it was challenging for them to get Bitcoin, for example. Uh, so what you see more and more is that young people are soliciting uh, to work, to work for Bitcoins and to be paid in Bitcoin, for example, to offer products or services. Um, lack of liquidity, um, oh, sorry, interchangeability. Again, I think what we have is a market at play. I, I, I can't think for the million entrepreneurs that are going to find solutions uh, for that. Um, but capital controls don't stop people from wanting to change their bad money into good money, so the market will provide a solution for that. I don't really have concrete answers, if that's an answer to you. Yeah, no, that's helpful. I, I guess I'm wondering, does that have to change in the, short, uh, in the short term for this to work, or do you think there'll just be so much pressure for it to change that over time. You mean like, People do we need more like, solutions today? I think, for do example, we need more liquid exchanges. Uh, yeah, and I think there's uh, interesting initiatives. Uh, there's uh, people talking about uh, liquidity pools, uh, actually, ex um, Bitcoin to Bitcoin loans between the exchanges. Uh, this would uh, create a lot more liquidity. That's that's a part of how um, banks work today. Uh, I think that's interesting. There's some risk involved, maybe, but I think it's really interesting looking forward. And, uh, of course, the more fiat money that flows into Bitcoin, the more um, liquid things uh, become. There's a lot of businesses, for example, today that are hesitating to get into Bitcoin because they, uh, they know that if they would do, they would push up the price or down uh, um, to their own detriment. Thanks a lot. Hi. Hi, I'm Gabriele from Italy. Uh, two consideration. Uh, I would like to let you know that uh, you can buy from me from, uh, at uh, $100,000 uh, at uh, Bitcoin, my Bitcoin, and uh, it's a game. No, uh, that's just a joke. Uh, I, I was, you don't uh, sell your Bitcoins, right? I don't, I'm not <laughs> going to sell, I'm going to hoard and to hold. But uh, as me, probably if we are here, we are going to save uh, as much as we can our Bitcoins. And uh, I was, uh, um, I was intention to to buy some cakes in San Francisco for Bitcoin. But now I'm really decided uh, if uh, to spend my Bitcoin for cakes. So, what is your opinion uh, uh, on the old issue of uh, hoarding instead of spending? Oh yes, of, uh, I think that's that's a very important issue: hoarding versus spending. A lot of people talk, uh, today, and I mentioned it yesterday also in the panel. A lot of people today. Uh, by the way, I think we have room for just one more question because then we really oh, have sorry. to respect these gentlemen. Um, 
Hoarding versus spending, I think this uh, is a grave misconception. I mean, uh, economic growth doesn't come from spending, it comes from saving in the first place. If you want to start a business, any business, want to build a factory, want to, want to have uh, um, workers uh, developing a product, they need time, they need uh, resources before there's even talk about profit. So you need savings to, in order to finance that. And uh, if we save in Bitcoin today, we can, we can help fund uh, future products, uh, projects, either as investors or as entrepreneurs ourselves uh, I think it's actually a very a very damaging notion that uh, we should spend our bitcoins and eventually this will happen and that's of course great uh, people buying and selling things in Bitcoin but I think for the moment uh, we we also have to worry about this transfer of wealth and uh, if we don't buy bitcoins somebody else is gonna have the purchasing power that we lose um, so that's my answer just final question well, I'm from Argentina, so I really don't hope that every country goes versus <laughs> <laughs> towards what Argentina is doing. Please don't, don't use it even as an example. Uh, no, my, my only reflection is that in, it's very difficult in Argentina to get the money out. Obviously, Bitcoin is, helps to do mm -hmm. so, but people is not going into Bitcoins because of it. I mean, I'm one of... of the, of the sure. Argentinians that promote Bitcoin. And one of the main questions we always get from press is, oh, this is a great way for taking money outside. And I can say that most of the, of the guys that are in Bitcoins right now do it because they believe in the, in the value of Bitcoin, no, right. not as a way of moving the money outside the country. Right. Uh, even though it's, it's, no, it's I possible. Think it's true so that, that's right. very interesting in Argentina. Everybody thinks that it's for, for moving it out, but What's happening is that lots of people are believing in bitcoins because they have, they know what happened before. They know how, uh -huh. how much uh, they lost when the Corralito came. The dollars are not dollars are not theirs, and mm -hmm. so really it's. A so you are spending all your bitcoins. Spending my bitcoins. <laughs> No, but I mean, no. I think it's both. I think what I, what I see is both is yes, there are people that are that are using it to 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 buy and sell, and, and the same the same as as in, in the U.S. But there's definitely people that uh, I mean, really, if I went to the the Bitcoin meetup in in Buenos Aires, there were almost 100 people there. Um, people were giving me business cards because they wanted to to work for bitcoins, um, and so uh, and so I guess I guess it's both. I, I would agree with you on that, right? Thanks very much. I'll leave it to the Bitcoin Fund now.